gather this offering today in the hope in the hope that it would help us, Lord God, and be used by you to become that family of believers committed to reaching people with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. We're always fighting for us, heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence here is silence, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you.
Well, there you go, a trailer from a uh, movie based on a book by John Hagee entitled Four Blood Moons comes out tomorrow. How many of you have heard about the blood moons in this last year? Yes, they have been all over the place. Well, today we're in the last of this uh, sermon series entitled Five Signs to Watch for 2015, and they are the heavenly signs, the heavenly signs that Jesus referred to in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So if you've got your Bibles, please, you're going to have to have a finger in each. I'd like for you today to look in Mark to start. Mark chapter 13, I'll be reading from verses 24 to verse 27. And uh, we want to look today at these heavenly signs. There are three heavenly, uh, three aspects of these heavenly signs we want to look at. First of all, what are the scriptures about this fifth sign? What are the signs of the fifth sign you should be watching for in 2015? And then thirdly, what should our reaction be when we see all this fervor about things like the blood moons and other signs in the heavens? You may remember the first four signs we've been looking at over these number of weeks. The first was apostasy, uh, that in the latter days before his return, Jesus said there would be great apostasy in the church, a great falling away. Secondly, he said there would be great evangelism, that that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end would come. The third sign, he said, is that there would be a rebuilt temple, that the temple would be rebuilt in order that at one point the Antichrist might go in as he predicted uh, and desecrate it. The fourth sign we looked at last week, or last, uh, or last week and then three weeks ago, was the sign of persecution. And uh, we talked even about the woman that we prayed for this morning. And I've had a few of you ask me. Uh, we're referring to her simply as BVOR006. She is this Iraqi hairdresser who has had to flee her home and is in a camp in uh, Jordan. And our denomination has been approached about sponsoring her as a refugee. And I've had three people come to me and say, Jake, I want to be part of that refugee team to pray for this woman, to raise some part potentially of the tens of thousands of dollars needed to see her brought here. But of course, there are all manner of people we could potentially sponsor. And, and there are many situations around the world, as we looked at, where persecution is breaking out, even against Canadians, uh, who we talked about, the Jarrett's. Uh, we're a Canadian family that are friends of some of the people here in this church who were in China for many years, running a cafe and teaching English near the North Korean border. And uh, Mr. Jared is still in prison, though his wife has been released uh, on charges of espionage. So persecution was the fourth sign. And the fifth sign we'll look at today, as we're going to read from Mark 13, are what I'm simply calling heavenly signs that cause earthly dismay. And uh, let's read today from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 27. But you'll have to have your fingers also in Luke and in Matthew. But we'll start with Mark 13, verse 24. But in those days, following that distress, following, I would argue, the great uh, tribulation, and, but in those days, following that distress, that distress where uh, there will be great persecution against the church, 
Jesus then quotes the, uh, the Joel, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Uh, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, verse 26, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with power and great glory. Amen. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. And then I want you to notice what comes immediately after verse 27. And this happens both in, uh, in all three, in Luke and in Matthew as well. Now learn this, verse 28, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things, plural, happen, you know that it is near, right at the door. And after each one of these heavenly signs, Jesus draws out the parable of the fig tree, which I want to keep in the back of our minds and refer to at the end of this sermon. And so what is this first aspect of this fifth sign we want to look at today? We want to look at the scriptures relating to this fifth sign. And I've read one version of it here, Mark 13. And in particular, I want you to look at verse 25, where Jesus says um, that, the heavens, uh, that the heavens will be shaken. Saluo is the word used there. And the Son of Man coming on the clouds and with great glory. That same word, shaken, saluo, is used also in the version of this in Luke 21. There will be signs in, in the sun and moon and stars and on earth, dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear and expectation of things which are coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens, verse 26 of Luke 21, will be shaken. Same word used in Matthew 24 as well. So what does Jesus mean when he says the heavens will be shaken? What should we be looking for? The same word, saluo, translated shaken, is used in Acts chapter 16 of a, of a very similar type of shaking. It was a shaking that Paul and, and Silas underwent in the prison. Uh, you may remember that story in Acts chapter 16, verse 26. And there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were saluoed, were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's hands, uh, everyone's bands were loosed. The book of Hebrews also uses this same word to talk about things that are shaken and things which are not shaken. Hebrews 12, 27. And this word, yet once more, signify at the removing of those things that are saluoed, that are shaken, as of things that are made, those things which cannot be shaken may remain, referring to the word of God. And so this sign is that the heavens will be shaken. And this word is most often used to talk about the movement of the waves on the ocean. But as we've seen, it's used in other ways to speak about things uh, that, that, that God will shake supernaturally, like the prison with that earthquake. Uh, and when you look at the, the Lucan version of this, you'll note that the shaking is not just uh, accompanied on its own. Know that there, this shaking and what goes on in the heavens causes a great perplexity among the nations. That really this, this final sign isn't just simply things that happen in the heavens, because things have been happening in the heavens for millennia. Whether they're eclipses of the sun, which was in the news this week that happened over uh, northern Europe, you may have heard and, and read about that. But it's not just simply that the heavens will be shaken, as it notes there. No, it's that things are shaken and the nations are perplexed by it. But immediately, verse 29 of Matthew 24, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth, Matthew writes, Jesus saying, will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of the sky with power and great glory. But note, who is it that is perplexed? Who is it that is perplexed? Who is it that mourns when we see all these things happen in the sky? Who is it that is, that is upset by them? Who is it that when we see the heavens shaken, experiences a shaking in their own lives? Is it the church in Mark 13 and Luke 21 and Matthew 21? Are we to be shaken? No, it's the nations. 
It's those who don't believe in Christ that when they see all these things happen, whether they're the blood moons, whether it's uh, the, the eclipse, whether it's all manner of things I may talk about today, it is unbelievers who are shaken by them. What is to be our response? Our response is not to be dismayed, not to be perplexed. Our response, as we've looked at throughout this, is to have faith. Our response is to share the gospel that the, that the world may know. Our response is to have hope, to lift up our heads, as it says in Luke, and see that our redemption draweth nigh. But our friends, our unsaved family and loved ones, they'll be shaken, they'll be dismayed. The question for you and I is not whether we believe John Hagee and what he has to say about the four blood moons. It's not whether uh, we think, you know, people being uh, perplexed at the eclipse that went on this week and wondering about what's going on in the heavens. It's not, you know, it, our question is, for us, is not to be perplexed by it. Our question is not to, to condemn our unsaved friends for being perplexed or interested in these things. Our response should be to say, hey, what do you think about that? You know that the Bible says that in the latter days the heavens will be shaken and to enter into a discussion with those that we know about the truth that we know and we have found and we have tasted and seen in Christ. Will we use even the shaking of the heavens as an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus? And I want you to note that it happens Matthew and Mark's version specifically say, after the tribulation or the distress of those days, this is going to happen. That there's a, a sequence but a convergence of things that happen here. And as I noted, in each case, both in, in, um, in Mark and in Luke and in Matthew, immediately after this whole passage about the heavens, Jesus says, look to the fig tree. So you too, Matthew 24, when you see all these things, the convergence of all these things happen, realize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation, which generation? This generation which sees all these things happen will not pass away until all these things take place. What is it we're looking for to happen at the same time in history? We're looking for apostasy, as I mentioned, evangelism on a worldwide basis, a rebuilt temple. We're looking for worldwide persecution, and we're looking for a heavenly signs that cause earthly distress. That when we see these things happen, what does Jesus say? He says, take heart. I am at the door. I am very near. You who see these terrible things happen, know that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, what is the second aspect of this fifth sign? What are the signs we see out there among us today of this fifth sign, of these heavenly signs? Well, uh, commentators and pastors and um, uh, prophetic people are, I mean, there's just an endless list of, of options as to what you could choose what you could say is the, is the heavenly sign. I just want to look briefly at three today because they're in the news, because they're most often around us. Uh, I would posit three options for what the heavenly sign that uh, could be that it would cause earthly distress. Uh, the one we're, we're in the midst of right now, uh, that is the blood moons. And you saw the, the trailer and you've heard a little about it. Well, what is a, a blood moon? It's a, it's, a, it's a lunar eclipse that happens to occur um, where the earth is between the moon and the sun and the moon glows red because of the lack of light shining on it or it's in the shadow of the earth. And, and it started last year on Passover and tabernacles of last year and on Passover and tabernacles of this year. There are four blood moons that happen to line up uh, with these Jewish festivals. And this has happened a, a number of times throughout history. Uh, it happened, as it was noted in the movie trailer, in 1492. Columbus saw them as, and was somehow part of guiding him here. If you want to know more about that, you can go watch the movie, which opens tomorrow. Uh, most interestingly, perhaps in our day, is it also happened in 1947 and 48, during the founding of the nation of Israel, and also happened in 1966 and 67, uh, leading up to and including the Seven Days War. And so many people have seen these blood moons and, and uh, connected them with this passage from Joel about the moon turning to blood in Acts chapter 2. And, and uh, it looks at that and, and says, hey, this has a prophetic significance for us. But look at Matthew 24, verse 30. 
It says the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And so one of the questions is, uh, how do these blood moons uh, in some way communicate anything about Christ? Could they really be the sign of the Son of Man? Well, the, uh, the Greek there in that passage could be taken at least one of two ways. It could be taken as what's called a possessive genitive, meaning the sign of the Son of Man or the sign belonging to the Son of Man. Is there some specific sign that Jesus maybe said would, would, would be his that would come in the sky? Or it could be what's called a genitive of opposition, meaning the sign that is the Son of Man. The sign is that the Son of Man will appear in the sky with power and great glory. I think it's to be taken that second way. That Jesus didn't say you would see my logo, you would see these blood moons, or you would see this or that thing in the sky, the Cairo of the Roman Catholic Church or something like that. No, no. He says, I am the sign. You'll see me coming with clouds and with great glory. And so the sign of the Son of Man is not going to be some heavenly star like attended his birth, or some comet, or some meteor, or even the blood moons. No, the sign that we're looking for is Jesus himself coming. He'll have faithful and true. He'll have that sword as it pictures in in the book of Revelation. But if you take it to mean belonging to it, it it, it could be something like these blood moons based on Acts 2.20. The sun sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before that great and glorious day of the Lord. Peter quotes that on Acts chapter 2. But there's a second... um, Uh, kind of favorite heavenly sign that uh, prophecy people look at, and that is an event that will occur in uh, in August of 2027. If you move ahead one there, Jared. That in August 2nd, 2027, there will be a noonday eclipse. Very important, it happened at noon. You'll see why in a moment. And it's a noonday eclipse that will pass over only as far as I'm able to read and understand, will pass only over one capital in the whole world, right at noon. And that will occur in the city of Jerusalem on August 2nd, 2027. And people have taken this fact that there will be a solar eclipse that happens right at noon, the the, the, the moment of, of 12 noon, on August 2nd, 2027, and they've taken that together with a passage from Zechariah chapter 14. If you've got your Bibles, go there. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Zechariah 14 is a passage about the great um, salvation that the Messiah will bring to the Jews who have been surrounded and who have been hemmed in in Jerusalem. And it talks about the coming of the Messiah back to the Mount of Olives and, and what he will do on that day to save his people. And in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, we read, In that day there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique, unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening there will be light. And so it talks here in this whole passage about an eclipse that will darken the day, but then it will get brighter again at night. And that on this one day, August 2nd, 2027, it will happen right at noon, and only over one capital in the world, the city of Jerusalem. And so some folks have gotten very excited about this date. Uh, No doubt, uh, as we get closer to this date, if John Hagee is still around and still preaching at Cornerstone, uh, is it Cornerstone Christian or Cornerstone Community Church in uh, San Antonio, Texas? I forget which it is. No doubt you you can look forward to books about this eclipse. I'm telling you now, that uh, you have probably books on your shelf entitled The Blood Moons. You'll have books with that date, and they'll come up with some fancy name to market it uh, a few years from now, August 2nd, uh, 2027. It could be this. But as I've said, I think that what the passage is referring to here is not a heavenly sign, some logo, some star, some comet, some eclipse. No, the sign is meant to be we will see Jesus Christ. And what will we see? Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. Listen to this. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. 
He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Uh, and his name is called the Word of God. And the enemy and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That, brothers and sisters, I think is the sign that we should be looking for. We should use eclipses and blood moons and comets and all of these things when they perplex our neighbors as opportunities to share. But the sign that you and I are looking for is our Redeemer come from heaven for you and I to take us to be, with, uh, to be with him forever. I love what Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, Revelation ends, in a sense, with that vision from Revelation 19. It begins with this vision, Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. It's interesting to me, Revelation 1, 7 contains a couple things that I, I like. The idea that Jesus is coming, Revelation, right at the book of the beginning of the book of Revelation, before the rapture, before anything else, we're told that his coming will be public. It won't be secret. It will be public that every eye will see him and it will somehow happen, and you can take this really literally as I want us to think about it a moment here, and it will happen in a way that is eternal. That those who pierced him could refer to potentially the Romans who literally put their spear into him. Sometimes it might be referred to, used to the Jews as they who pierced him by using the Romans. But I prefer to think of it in the most literal sense possible. That somehow the second coming of Christ will happen after everyone has been resurrected. And those who literally beat Jesus, those who literally put their spear in his side, will, be, will come back to life as the scriptures predict. Some of us will be resurrected unto life. Some of us will be resurrected unto, unto eternal hellfire. And before that's all decided, they who pierced him, the scripture says, will see Jesus' return in triumph. Well, what should our response be? When we see these blood moons, when we go and see J uh, Hagee's movie, or we worry, start to worry now about the eclipse that will happen in 2027, what should our response be when we, when we see these situations? As I've noted, Jesus concluded each one of the passages about these heavenly signs by referring to the parable of the fig tree. Now learn the parable of the fig tree, Jesus said, Matthew 24, 32. When its branches have already become tender and it puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Look at verse 35 of Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Look at its emphasis, the convergence of signs. The branch has become tender and it's put forth its leaves. You know that summer is near, that these three things come together. Its branches are, are tender. It's, it's, it's put forth its leaves and summer is in the air. You know that summer is coming when there's a convergence of these things. Not just that the branch is tender. No, no. It's tender and it's put forth its leaves. There's more than one thing happening at once here. And what is the emphasis of the parable? That all these things we read and see and hear, they will pass away. But Jesus says, my words will not pass away. Psalm 100, 1989, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides Forever. And so what is our reaction when we see all these things? Not to trust in what our eyes see in the heavens. Not to trust even in what our ears hear from one another and from the media. No, our reaction in all of these things, according to Jesus' emphasis here in the parable of the fig tree, is heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, trust my word. That's our reaction. When our friends are shaken by every eclipse, by every blood moon, by everything that comes into their life, when our friends are shaken, they're shaken precisely because they haven't built their life upon the rock of his word. And so what should our reaction be when we see people around us, when we have 
even sometimes ourselves, been tempted when we're watching the news and we see all these things and we wonder. Our reaction should be to go back to God's word and to draw from it the confidence that Jesus wanted his followers to have. Well, what are some what nows? Okay, Jake, in light of all this, what should I do now? Well, instead of fear, I want you to pray. Instead of being afraid of these heavenly signs, afraid of seeing people shaken all around you, instead of being fearful, I want you to pray. Psalm 56, 11, in God I have put my trust, David wrote. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Brothers and sisters, I've been, uh, partly because of getting ready for past sermons and just as God's Spirit is leading and, and moving and doing various things in my life and in the life of our church, I've been doing a lot of reading about folks in the persecuted church. In fact, even this morning at the 9 a.m. prayer meeting, uh, Stu, the leader there, had two books he was waving around about persecuted churches and persecuted Christians he's been, uh, he's been reading. And Psalm 56, 11, In God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? This to me is, the, is one of the great lessons of reading from and about and talking with Christians who have been through a lot more than you and I have been through for their faith. A lot of us have been through a lot here. Not necessarily because of our faith. But you talk to somebody who's grown up in Pakistan or India or somewhere in the Arabian Gulf or in Egypt. You know, when, when Tabit Magali, Pastor Tabit Magali, a Coptic Christian who works um, with Muslim background believers in St. Catharines, if he comes again and teaches his intro to Islam course, one of the things he'll do is he'll hike up, hike up his, uh, what do you call these, your sleeves, and he'll hold out his wrists like this, and you'll see on his wrist, you'll see he's a pastor, but you'll see he's tattooed. You see he has two crosses, and they're Jerusalem crosses. They look like plus signs, but they're crosses. And they're right here on his wrists, one here and, and one there. And, and you and I might quote to ourselves that verse from, from Leviticus, you know, about not marking yourself and not tattooing and all that kind of stuff. You say, well, why is this pastor, this Egyptian Coptic Christian pastor, why is he tattooed? And then he'll tell you the story that, that when young children are born in Egypt, girls and boys... Uh, not very long after uh, a certain birthday, and I forget which one it is, to be honest, their fifth or sixth birthday, they're taken by their parents and they're, they're tattooed with the cross to keep them from being kidnapped by those of another faith that, that populates their nation. The girls, of course, would be kidnapped and become the fifth or sixth wife of a, and, and locked up, and, and she would have um, what would essentially become Muslim children, as it were. The, the young boy would be potentially kidnapped and, and done away with, so he couldn't have any more Christian children. And it's a way to kind of ethnically cleanse that particular country. And so parents t kidnap in order to identify them as Christians. And of course, this is seen as a kind of idol by the Muslims, and so they don't want to touch any kid that might have an idol on their hand. So it's a way to ward off. Imagine growing up where you're sending your kid off to school and all your, you know, all your, I mean, you're trusting in the Lord, but you're also trusting in them being, in a sense, defaced in order to bring them home safe to you. And so instead of fear, brothers and sisters, let's pray. Let's adopt that kind of attitude that so many in the persecuted church have, that so many believers today have, that certainly David had in Psalm 56 what can man do to me? You know, what can our loved ones really do to us when we share the gospel with them and they say no again? You know, what can, they, what can my coworkers do when on my own time I share the gospel with them again? And they, yeah, they maybe get a little perturbed to say, oh, you know, there goes Dennis again going on about whatever. You know what? Can we get a little boldness, a little less fear, a little more faith? Can we really set ourselves to praying that God will give us this kind of attitude? In God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? All of this is passing away. That's something that these scriptures point at, that it's all going to be shaken, it's all going to melt, it's all going to pass away. What will stand forever is God's word and our testimony to it. Instead of avoidance, read. Lots of us, when it comes to this topic of the second coming, we just want nothing to do with it. We say, you know, Pastor, this is just way too heavenly minded. This has got nothing to do with how to raise my family better, how to be a better husband, how to, you know, be a better small group leader, how to be a better employee or a better employer. And I would disagree. And not just me, 
Jesus would disagree. Twice in the book of Revelation, once at the beginning and once at the end, Jesus says this, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of this prophecy of this book. Twice Jesus promises that people will be blessed, people will be happy, people will be at at peace with God and man and their circumstances. That's what that word blessed means. People will experience my shalom when they read and heed the words of this prophecy, uh, the book of Revelation. It says it twice under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't cause us to say, hey, if you read 1 Timothy, you'll be blessed. I believe you will be, but the Holy Spirit didn't inspire Paul to write that. The Holy Spirit didn't even inspire Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to say, you'll be blessed if you read these Gospels. No, but the Holy Spirit did inspire John when he wrote the book of Revelation to twice, once at the beginning and once at the end, say, hey, you want to be blessed? Read this book. You're going to read this book? You're going to be blessed. And so instead of avoiding the topic of the second coming, instead of avoiding things like the blood moons and eclipses in 2027 and all these things that we can sometimes think are out there and just have nothing to do with my everyday life, why don't we just, instead of avoiding, why don't we read? Why don't we let the Holy Spirit do some work in our lives and bless us as he promised he would? And don't take my word for it. Take his. I didn't write the book of Revelation. He did. And he says, if you read it, you will be happy. You will be blessed. And so take God at his word and dive in instead of avoiding. Or at least put your little toe in the, in the shallow end of the pool. What's the last now what today? The last now what is instead of fanaticism, focus on Jesus Lots of us here are on that one pole of avoidance. We want nothing to do with topics about the second coming in the Bible and all these things, but lots of other of us are over here. And you might come up later and correct me. Well, no, Jake, that eclipse is not on August 2nd, 2027. It's actually July 1st, 2028. Or you, know, or you say, well, what about the, you know, forget the four, four blood moons, Jake. What about this, this thing that's going on? Or what about this other book that David Jeremiah has written? Or what about the Antichrist and the worldwide government? Why didn't you talk about the, the, the number of the beast? And, and all these other things that, that we can get into when we come to talk about the second coming. And I would just simply say, I'm not calling you a fanatic, but just for the sake of argument, instead of fanaticism, can we just focus on Jesus? That's what I've tried to keep in my mind through these topics. I could have spiced them up and done all kinds of things, and you've heard, and you can go watch, and you can go see. People say all kinds of things about the second coming, but But I just was really spoken to this week when I was at Jump and was preparing for Jump and we were looking at Revelation 14 and it was talking there about um, some of the judgments that will come on the earth. And Revelation 14, 12 just really spoke to me. It says, "Here here is the perseverance of the saints, the holy ones, who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. This is what it meant to be a saint under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle John. What does it mean to be a saint? It means me, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus, their trust in Jesus. And in light of all the things that are going on around them in Revelation 14, it's these two simple items that these saints keep in mind. To keep living, Revelation 14, 12, the way God wants me to live, but then to keep my faith in Jesus. So simple. Keep trusting in him. Don't get so enamored with all the latest books and all the latest videos. and all. I mean, you know, look, I showed the trailer. Go see the movie. Enjoy it. Take it for what it is. Use it as an opportunity to share your faith in Christ. But don't delve into the fanaticism of it. Don't get so caught up in the, in the trees you miss the forest. Jesus is the forest. He's the one I want you to fall in love with. He's the one I want you to find in the book of Revelation. He's the one I want you to look for from heaven. He's the one I want you to trust in. He's the one who will never let you down. And so if you're here today and you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never come to that place in your life where you say, oh, Jake, I'm a sinner. I just know that I'm apart from God. I can feel it. You've never said that. If you're here today and you've never said, oh, and I know my sin, 
It's, it's going to separate me from God eternally. That the wages of my sin is death. But Romans 6.23, I know the gift of God, thirdly, is, the, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, my Lord. You've never come, you've never said any of those three things, let alone the fourth thing, which is to come to that place in your life. And maybe you've come to that place today where you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you, as the scripture says, can be saved. You've never said those four things, but maybe through things that have been going on in your life, maybe something God's been saying to you today, you want to come to that place and you want today to be the day where you fly your balloon for Jesus, as it were. You believe that you're a sinner. You know that your sin is separating you from, from God eternally. You accept Christ's gift of eternal life uh, because of his forgiveness, and you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If that's the place you want to be today, you want to become a follower of Christ, of, you want to become a Christian today, then I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and I want you to pray that prayer after me in your heart. So just everybody bow your heads for a moment here. I know a lot of us have made this decision already. If you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, then you're joining people here and around the world who trust in Jesus Christ. And so if today's the day you want to become a Christian, then just repeat this prayer or use your own words with these ideas in your own heart. And you're directing it to the Lord God Almighty through Jesus Christ. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you today and will eternally. But I know that Jesus died to pay the penalty for my sin. And I know that in him I now can find forgiveness and life and freedom. Please forgive me for my sins, Lord God. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please help me to live for you forever. And please enable me to share what I have found in Jesus with those I meet every day. In his name, amen. Well, the worship team is going to come on up now, and they're going to lead us in a, uh, in a final song. If, uh, if you're somebody who prayed that prayer today, uh, I'd love for you to come forward. I'm going to be standing here at the front, facing the front, singing. But if you're here today and you prayed that prayer, I'd love to pray with you. So just come on up, slide in beside me here, and I would just love to pray with you and pray a prayer of encouragement, give you a few materials just to help you in your walk with Christ. But we're going to stand together and sing now. I believe the song we're going to sing is God of the City. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done in this city.
You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like Jesus ended the book of Revelation by saying, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Amen. God bless, and have a great Sunday.